I'm Nicole. I'm Geraldine. I'm Lauren. And this is Doing, Doing the, the Damn, damn thing. thing, an entrepreneurship talk show. Hi, my name is Lena Carew, and I'm the head of organizational health and innovation at the Justice Collective. And one thing that I really wish someone had told me uh, before I became an entrepreneur is that you don't have to go to business school to be an entrepreneur. Uh, that in fact, there's many different ways to learn, um, and uh, you might save yourself a lot um, in the process. But if you feel that that's the right way to go, go for it. I went to business school as well, um, but I believe that had I really felt a lot of confidence in myself, um, I might have chosen a different path. Don't let it stop you. Hi, I'm Ellie Thumbuan and I am Head of Strategy and Culture at the Justice Collective. One thing I wish someone would have told me before going into business is I wish they would have said, the more true you are to yourself, the better your business will be. And I've seen that play out again and again I wish I would have known then that I was capable of being as confident as I am now and that believing in yourself really does have a tangible effect in your business. Hello everyone and welcome back to our channel. We are so grateful that you are here. Before we dive into today's video, make sure you're going to hit that red button, subscribe, ring that bell so you get notifications for our videos. You're going to like the video and of course comment below. If you're here on Facebook, make sure to like our page, like our video and share the video. Be Just be super nice. Thank you so much. <laughs> so we are here with the Justice Collective and we are going to be talking about social conscious business. I know it's like a lot of words thrown at you guys, <laughs> and they are going to help us figure out what exactly does that mean. But before we get into that, tell us who you two are. So the Justice Collective uh, launched in 2015, um, really on the heels of the Black Lives Matter movement. At the time, um, you know, we are a collective, and we were started by a small group of about eight of us, um, trying to figure out how can we make the impact that we want to see in the yeah. world, um, and do that as our primary job. And many of us in different situations, but many of us were feeling the limitations of our day-to-day -day jobs. Mm -hmm. And um, many of us also were coming from uh, the nonprofit sector, um, governmental agencies, and feeling like, you know, while we're charged to um, make an impact, you know, you're still limited by someone else's agenda, someone else's strategic plan, mm -hmm. not having been included in that, and mm -hmm. feeling like, what's more for me? Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we decided to come together to start something. And early on, we weren't exactly sure what that was going to look like. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, to our, to our, our delight and surprise, uh, we got a contract almost right away. We're like, okay. We should uh, be a company now. <laughs> so how do you like? How do you accept money, right? Yeah. So it's like, okay, here we go, right? Uh, so m many more lessons uh, to share about that. Uh, but really, um, since then we've grown tremendously, and Ellie has been pivotal in in our growth and establishment as as a company. That first year was really like we're forming, right? It's a lot like being in the womb, right? It's like mm -hmm. you know changing over time, figuring out like what is our approach to our work, what is our service offering um, and many people that were there in the beginning weren't there a year later you know the faces kind of changed or the values stayed really solid um, so we've been working from a, a pretty strong foundation that we can talk about a little bit more later um, but really over time I would say it was really 2016 um, when Ellie came on in 2017 when Ellie came on as an owner um, that we really formed our framework and approach for uh, racial justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion for organizations, which we can talk more about what that consultancy now is. Yeah. Ditto everything. Ditto everything. <laughs> <laughs> she was telling the truth. Great okay, job. Good. Okay. All Woo! true. Well, <laughs> and you, guys, you guys have an office, in, you have a few other offices besides here in Oakland, right? Yeah. That's correct. Uh, we were founded here, very proud of that, here in Oakland, California. Uh, we now have an office in New Orleans, Louisiana, as well as just recently in Chicago, Chicago Illinois. Yeah. Yeah. Very That's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So you guys expanded quickly. All cities that I love to drink at. There's <laughs> <amazing cities. laughs> not by accident. Yeah. 
Viagra. Not Viagra. <laughs> so I have a question. Um, I saw on your website, and you also just mentioned now that you're a social impact consultancy. Mm-hmm. So what exactly does that mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. A lot of assumptions in there. Um, so social impact can mean lots of things to lots of different people. Um, having spent a decade in philanthropy and in the nonprofit sector, as Lena had mentioned previously, um, it's the expectation that uh, you can help people with things beyond their bottom business line. So that includes things like working with community. That includes considering what is the social impact of the business or the organization itself. Um, In truth, everyone is a social impact organization Mm -hmm. and the extent to whether that impact is good, bad, complicated, or neutral totally depends. Um, So happy to talk that's a good point. That. Yeah. yeah, I never thought about it like that. But yeah. That's true. We are yeah. all socially impacting. <laughs> Frida K. Poor Klein has been quoted saying that many times, but many, many, many brilliant women have said that before. Yeah. Well, um, I think speaking about well, what you guys are saying is is that you have a positive. You work with people to have positive impact, and um, that and since the topic yes. of the. Uh, the show today was specifically around social conscious businesses. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How does that fit into what you do and what? why is it important that people consider having a socially conscious business? Really, what does that mean too? Because that's mm-hmm. a big thing, a big yeah. word. Sure. Um, <laughs> well, our lens in our work, and there's, I would say that the field that we're operating within, equity, diversity, and inclusion, is an expanding field and new in some ways, um, and that the field um, that existed prior is much more traditional diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Um, And so for us, when we think about social consciousness, um, we can't do that without first engaging in racial consciousness as well. So we have a very particular lens around race consciousness and other forms of social consciousness um, Mm -hmm. that all intersect race. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, part of our, um, I would say, like competitive edge is that we talk about and acknowledge and actually center um, something that's really difficult and Mm -hmm. hard to talk about, especially in this political climate, just for many, many very valid reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, and then once we can push through that, then we can expand on all the ways in which companies and organizations um, impact positively, negatively, or otherwise, um, society, yeah. um, or internally, an organizational culture. Yeah. Um, organizations are simply people in the aggregate, mm-hmm. right? So, uh, and so they're operating within a broader social context mm-hmm. um, that you can't separate, right? And I think that capitalism will try to get you to say that has nothing to do with business, yeah. mm-hmm. right? But we are human people. Versus other yeah. forms of human. There are some <laughs> other categories yes. of human. <laughs> We're not here to talk about it. But, <laughs> but, but my point being is that, you know, people come with who they are and their experience, mm-hmm. right? And that's what's shaping um, priorities, budget line items, um, you know, strategic initiatives, mm-hmm. policies, practices, and all of, and everything in between, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so we have to acknowledge that people cannot um, separate who they are, their experience, where they want to go, where their passions are, um, from uh, the way in which we um, advise um, organizations and their development. Yeah. Uh, Else. Yeah, I, th- I think the, the, the thing I wanted to add around the value proposition and, and really why we center race in addition yeah. to the justice aspect of it um, is because when we focus on race um, through the intersecting identities of all other diversity factors that are in fact racialized, like gender being mm-hmm. one of them, Um, gender and sexuality and and a host of other um, identifiers. Um, I have a management consulting background and and one of the things I found when I was learning how to specialize in this six years ago was that when you apply a race lens to management strategy, you're actually increasing operational efficiency in ways that most folks don't even imagine. 
in that once you're making working conditions, business culture, workplace culture different um, and uh, more effective for everyone on the team, everyone else benefits, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that goes right down to the bottom line. So it's, it's a really cool aha moment for those that we worked with. Um, and deep. yeah, it is, yeah. it is, deep. Yeah. that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Yeah. So to piggyback off of what both of you have said, it's, you know, one of the business, you know, and I do a business owner just wakes up one day, you know, and mm -hmm. it's like, I would like to be more socially, like, um, conscious, like, aware. Like, mm -hmm. I want my business to be that way. Mm -hmm. What exactly is their first step? Like, what would you tell mm. that business owner, like, or just that business team, you know, the C-level, like, you know, okay, they thought it was, like, so great for them to come and be like, we're going to do this, you know? Yeah. Hire the Justice Collective? There Hire us, <laughs> obviously. Um, I think going back to Lena's point about being people <laughs> and the fact that, you know, there's relationship expert Esther Perel who says that we all bring our own emotional resume into mm -hmm. work as well as into I our like relationships. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, <laughs> you might see that on our quotes. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to use. Um, we, we also bring our identities, all of our identities to work, whether we feel at liberty to express them and really be ourselves or not. Um, and so we start with the business owner. We start mm -hmm. with getting to know that person really understanding their personal motivations, their experiences, how those have shaped their business ideology. Mm -hmm. And we could go into a ton of detail, but we take it from there. Yeah. Would you add mm -hmm. anything? Yeah, I would say that uh, maybe if there's a, a, an initial step before someone, an organization has decided to commit resources, Mm -hmm. um, to a qualified organization such as ours. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, they might want to start with talking, uh, you know, with, uh, with folks mm -hmm. um, in their organization mm -hmm. right. to open up a normalize uh, conversations about people's experience within the organization yeah. that relates to, mm -hmm. um, you know, how they feel about their belonging or the space that they occupy there, right? Um, so, you know, I think that the more an organization is able to have build that trust among their teams or across teams, um, the better off and the more primed an organization is to dig much deeper, which, is, which is where we go. Yeah. I would also say that there um, always has to be a buy-in from leadership. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can't really get around it. <laughs> and, and leadership is often, um, by and large, um, led by, you know, occupied by folks that have traditionally held power, mm -hmm. right? Um, so this, and then therein lies um, the challenge and why more organizations aren't currently pursuing yeah. this line of work. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can see that being a challenge of like trying to get a company, they say they want it, but then I can see like there might be some clients where there is pushback when you're trying to open it opening them up, you know? Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's a vulnerable topic. Yeah, it's <laughs> yucky. It's like, yeah, we don't talk about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Totally. So what do you find are common struggles and fears that business leaders have when you're starting to work with them? Mm. There can be a few. Um, <laughs> happy to take this one. Uh, or start. Oh, um, one, the cost. Uh, depending on the industry or the sector, mm -hmm. there can be a perception <laughs> that this is really expensive work to try on. Um, and again, that, that really depends on the perspective you carry into mm -hmm. your work and all the way down to why you started the company or your role in it. Um, so people f perceive sometimes very wrongly and accurately that it's expensive. Um, sometimes they worry about uh, turning off certain sectors of their market, certain mm -hmm. customers, mm -hmm. right? Like they worry occasionally about the politics of it. Okay. 
Um, but usually that's when they haven't really had a lot of time to be thoughtful about who they're already aiming to engage um, in, you know, just different consumer markets or um, develop their own messaging around how this work is connected to their company values. Mm -hmm. Um, And usually there's a way to tie it back. Usually there's something in their values, their mission or their vision um, that's very easy to tie back to this work and it totally makes sense. I would say the other thing is um, they don't know what they don't know, right? Which is very common and something a lot of us understand. So until it's really spelled out for them what their options are, um, they could feel like they're opening Pandora's box. And fear of the unknown, that uncertainty, that discomfort with um, just not knowing can hold some people back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the greatest experience, you know, Mm -hmm. around the fears that I've had. I would, um, I totally agree. I would add um, that even within our experience of organizations that are willing to invest, Mm -hmm. maybe even have a line item because they're a good Mm -hmm. social justice (laughs) organization, Mm -hmm. um, that even still, uh, when we really dig into the work, Mm -hmm. um, feelings, um, in addition to uh, the challenges that people experience on a personal level and even interpersonal, Um, there can be a lot of struggle to um, be open to uh, critique or analysis around what they fundamentally do. Right. Mm. Right? It actually might call into a question your entire approach Mm -hmm. as an organization. Mm -hmm. And I think any of us sitting here (laughs) at this table Mm -hmm. would feel like you're all of a sudden have no clothes on in the middle of the street, you know, when someone's saying, okay, and so here's, you know, where you arrive to a moment and you say, actually, I really need to rethink what what I'm doing or how I'm doing it Mm -hmm. um, or whether I should do it or who should be informing what I do. Mm -hmm. Um, And... I think that, um, you know, it, rightfully, that's a huge challenge for organizations. I think, um, I'm going to end there. Yeah. It sounds scary. <laughs> sounds sounds scary. scary. Yeah. Yeah. It totally is, right? Yeah. Like stepping off a cliff. I, yeah. I have yeah. one wow. clarifying question about being a socially conscious business. We're talking uh, through um, racial equity mm-hmm. um, because that's primarily what you guys focus on. Mm -hmm. And is a socially conscious business, like does, if someone says, oh, we have a whole recycling program now, is that, Mm -hmm. is this like, (laughs) what are kind of the parameters of being a socially conscious Mm -hmm. business or? So thank you for bringing up the concept of vanity metrics. So we call vanity (laughs) metrics things that companies can choose to do to superficially look like they're checking off the box Mm -hmm. around social consciousness. Um, And we know that when they are willing to go a little deeper, not only do their employees, their leadership, their product, um, their messaging and advertising have incredible potential to change, um, they also have incredible in more greater impact um, that often results in a difference in sales, which is the quickest thing to measure. Mm-hmm. So it can include everything from, I mean, we've advised corporations on everything from employee training to um, how they hire and fire security um, to things like environmental and triple bottom line um, at components that are easy to do, often easier than they think. Mm -hmm. Um, So I guess, you know, the answer is pretty broad. And that's incredible news (laughs) because companies can do so much and most of them don't even realize it. Mm-hmm. There's not like an actual list that people go or like a certification. Well, I mean, that's yeah, a serious yeah. question. I mean, we're yeah. in California in the Bay Area, so we actually probably do have a little bit more context for yeah. some of these things than a lot of our viewers are around the country. Sure. You know? so also just yeah, so we, we're actually in the development of, um, of an index mm-hmm. to measure a company's fitness on those, uh, on those 
criteria. Right. Um, just like there's an environmental index and other types mm-hmm. of indexes around like a fair and, and free workplace. Um, but the standards continue to change. And the greater uh, demand of the public in the economy, the consumer market, and, and the, the rise of expectations of mm-hmm. consumers in wanting to buy from socially uh, conscious and responsible brands um, is a huge incentive and a motivator mm-hmm. for a lot of companies, or should be for a lot of companies. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like I want to ask you more of your personal um, mm-hmm. experiences with entrepreneurship and building this business. I, I could foresee a lot of challenges that you might have had because of a number of things. <laughs> One, I mean, first and foremost, just being three partners, yeah. also being um, spread out throughout the country, mm-hmm. and then obviously, you know, with the subject matter and what you guys are putting yourself as out as into the world. Mm-hmm. Um, But what challenges have you two dealt with throughout the business that you'd like to share with our audience? Hmm. Um, Countless, every day. How many days have we been a business? How many challenges we've had? Um, But what stands out, maybe, is the better way to answer that question. Um, uh, There's always um, growing pains. and, and in, in, it's really the overcoming those growing pains where um, we have realized the most success. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that we have confronted um, challenges that include who, who are we? Mm-hmm. What is, how do we define mm-hmm. our I impact? Define, yeah. Right? To what is our brand positioning? to what is our pricing structure, Mm -hmm. Uh, then what is the financial model, and who do we hire, and when do we hire, I mean. (laughs) All of the same challenges. All of the same challenges, and we're trying to get it done in a two hour meeting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And we're trying to ask you in a (laughs) two second question about the challenges. That's right. (laughs) Yeah, you know. Yeah, um, I mean, a lot of just the premise of this television, or this YouTube show is that um, entrepreneurs, and that a lot of entrepreneurs don't have other entrepreneurs to talk to. Uh, yeah. So sure. it's just great to hear, I think, yeah. in general, that like a lot of the struggles that you guys are having that are mm-hmm. growing nationally are the same that one person might oh, have just yeah. like being alone in an office by themselves, yeah. you yeah. know? Yeah. Right. How about you, Ellie? Do you have anything to yeah, add? Yeah, you know what it, what it comes up for me, everything Lena said, and I think also to call out uh, and recognize the hustle and grind culture, right? Mm-hmm. Like, especially as women entrepreneurs, especially as um, women of color entrepreneurs, like the, the imposter syndrome, the fatigue, all of those things um, around perception of what is expected of us and having to be better mm-hmm. you know than than all the other shops and um, the recognition of when to delegate when to outsource yes. that we don't have to do it all in order to be successful in fact we've learned you know in a, in a creative division of labor that um, we're much more successful <laughs> you know yeah. like making the decision to hire making decisions to outsource and delegate um, and there was something Lena said in a conversation we were having before this session around leaning into our values in a different mm-hmm. way, um, which, you know, abundance is one of them. And um, she had shared uh, that I totally agree with um, and relate to the moment of leaning into that trust in ourselves um, and just how pivotal that is. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's terrifying. It can be really, really scary. Um, but it helps grease the wheel on problem solving in a whole new way. Yeah, yeah. thank you for the question. <laughs> thank you for all your answers. Yeah. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you both for being here. I really appreciate it. Sure. All their information will be in the description box below. We will also tag them here on Facebook. So thank you all for being here. We'll see you next week. Bye. 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 <laughs> We're so proud and excited to share that our business partner, Danielle DeRyder Williams, who's in New Orleans right now and can't be with us in person for today, has been named by Conscious Company Magazine as one of their top world-changing women in conscious business. 
Thank you, congratulations, Danielle. Thank you for shining a light on our work here at the Justice Collective.